ever traveled in an airplane, you've probably noticed the uncomfortable feeling that, that takes place in your ears during takeoff and landing. It's caused by a difference in pressure between your inner ear and the pressure of the outside atmosphere, which is changing quickly as the plane gains or loses its altitude. Now, try this simple experiment, will you? First of all, take a single sheet of notebook paper and lay it flat on the ground. Now, step up onto that paper. You're now at a higher altitude. Do you notice the pressure difference? <laughs> of course not. The change is so small that it's completely unnoticeable. Now, I'd like to speak to you for a moment about a high-tech, super-sensitive instrument that's been developed which is able to perceive even smaller pressure differences than those that you just experienced on the top of that piece of paper. Do you have any idea what it is? Ah, despite this instrument being extremely complex and intricate, it doesn't cost a thing. And most of us have two of them. Uh, these, of course, are your ears. Your ears are incredible precision instruments that are capable of perceiving these and even smaller pressure differences. Not in atmospheric pressure, but in sound waves. Now, these sound waves are essentially pressure waves that travel through the air. Try standing too closely to a loudspeaker or an amplifier, and you can actually feel these, these sound waves with your entire body. Quieter no noises, however, such as a whisper, aren't felt by our bodies, but they are still detectable by our ears. Now here's how it works. Sound waves enter into the ear through the auditory canal and cause va vibrations on the tympanic membrane, also known as our eardrum. These vibrations of the eardrum cause the movement of an intricate system of three of the smallest bones in the human body, the hammer, hammer, the anvil, and the stirrup. Not only do these tiny bones serve to amplify the sound waves, but amazingly, they are also equipped with special muscles that dampen the loud sounds that are too excessive. What's even more amazing is that this is all done automatically. From there, the energy waves are then transmitted to a spiral-shaped, bony, fluid-filled structure called the cochlea which is about the size of a pea, and it looks very much like a snail shell. Time would fail to describe the incredible complex mechanical processes that take place within the cochlea. But suffice it to say that the mechanical vibrations of the bones in the middle of the ear cause impulses, proportional impulses, in the fluid of that cochlea. Those impulses are transmitted in the fluid and travel through the labyrinth of the spiral-shaped channels of the cochlea and ultimately cause the movement of thousands of tiny hair-like structures called the stereocilia. It's the bending of these tiny hair-like structures that opens the channels in the tips of the hairs to allow the flow of ions into the cells beneath. Now, these are then transmitted to the brain and interpreted by the brain as sound. Think about it. Everything you hear, the bark of a dog, the sound of the train, the harmony of a symphony orchestra, all cause these tiny hairs to bend in a distinct and unique fashion to allow the precise type of ion flow to the brain that enables us to distinguish between thousands of different sounds. Aren't you glad you don't have to understand all of that to enjoy it? The more we learn about the ear, the more we find that the complexity of the ear is absolutely mind-boggling. It's also evident that each of the components of the ear described above, along with many more that weren't even mentioned, are absolutely essential for our hearing to occur. Now, with all these moving and interdependent parts, is it really reasonable to conclude that the various parts of the ear could have developed simultaneously in a series of random, gradual changes over time? How many random changes had to occur before any sort of hearing was even achieved? Considering these and other challenging questions, could it be that a more logical and straightforward conclusion is 
that the incredible design of the ear requires an equally incredible and intelligent designer. Answers to this question may vary, but the facts of the ear's amazing complexity do not, and they're clear for everyone to see. Which way does the evidence lead you, my friend? You decide.